So it looks like we have nine people online right now. Does is are do most of the people just join the live stream or how does how does it usually work? Uh they will be on the Zoom. Oh, okay. Uh, There's a Zoom. I mean I meant I meant Google Meet, sorry. Oh sure. Yeah. Okay. Um and then okay, uh if they have questions, they can put them in the chat and then depending on what your preference is, we can like either answer the questions as we go or we can do them all at the end. Sure, I can also like I I have the talk separated into three or four sections, so we could also stop after each section and you know if there have been any accumulated questions, we can touch on those. Are there usually a lot of questions? Some questions, no questions. Uh this is the first guest talk for this year, so I am not completely okay right now. Sure. Okay. Um, give me like one second while I get a USB connection. Yep. No problem. And, and sorry, I didn't get your name. You're Krish, right? Yeah, so I am Krish. I am uh, the co-head for Everay's biology course. Right. Um, and then everyone here, this is Mr. Samir Rajesh. He's a student. I'm not a mister. <laughs> I'm not that much older than you guys. That's true. He's a student at UC Berkeley studying uh, molecular uh, biology. Molecular and cell biology. Yep. Whenever you are ready, you should have access to screen share. Oh, okay, we can go ahead and get started then. All yes. right. Um, let me see. Best for video and animation. No, I don't want to do that then. Um, a window. Sweet. Okay. Share. Can everybody see my slides? Is this all people can see? Yes. Be okay, uh, it turns out I cannot actually see the Google Meet window, so somebody else will have to ask questions as we go along. I will do that. But yeah, we can go ahead and get started. So, so hey guys, my, um, my name is Samir, as Krish mentioned, and today I'm going to be uh, giving a talk. I don't know why I titled it. It's kind of a cheesy title now that I look back on it, but um, the gist of this talk is going to be on biophysics, model building, and what's next for structural biology. And we're going to just kind of go through a survey of different ideas that have come to focus over the last say 10 years and also over the last century. So it's gonna be a pretty wide spanning talk. So I wanna start off since we're gonna be talking about model building anyway with a quote that I think it's important for anyone who's going into science, science research, scientific career in general to kind of keep in mind. Um, this is a quote from a famous English statistician um, named George Box, which says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Basically, what he's getting at here is the idea that, you know, if you have data or you have some observations or you've witnessed some phenomenon in nature or you've looked at something and said, hey, this looks interesting, you can try and construct a model to explain what you're seeing. For example, some models could be just like a linear regression model that explains, you know, the rate of temperature increase with CO2 emissions. This was, I think, done by Svante Arrhenius in the 1800s. And he said, you know, when you have increased CO2, you have an increased uh, atmospheric temperature. And this was one of the first uh, experiments kind of claiming that the earth is warming a little bit. And, you know, this is a good model, um, but no model is perfect. No model is going to be able to fit your data perfectly. No model is going to be able to explain nature exactly as it is. The best you can do is a good approximation, which can explain most things you see, which is why he says that some models are useful. They're useful in the sense that they can tell you what's going on to a general sense, or they can show you, hey, this was a wrong idea. This model is wrong but here's why, and it can give you some other information about you know, how to build a better model. And so this is an important thing for anyone who's going into the scientific career to keep in mind. And so I thought I would start with it since we're gonna be talking about models later today anyway. 
So um, I've divided the talk into three or four sections. I'm not sure which anymore. Um, but the first talk is titled A Physicist's Thoughts on Biology. And this will be a common theme going through um, because I'm going to be talking a lot about a sort of newer field um, in, in the world, which is called biophysics. And it's kind of the alignment of ideas from physics into the biological world and how we can look at biological phenomenon using um, basic ideas from, uh, from physics. So 1944, I think, uh, this is right before the end of World War II, and it's a really burgeoning time for a lot of theoretical physicists. As you may know, um, a lot of physics is going on when people are developing the nuclear bomb, people are thinking about quantum mechanics and relativity. So this is a really great time in history for doing physics. You know, you're, if you're doing physics at this time, you're really having a good life. And so in 1944, uh, a physicist by the name of Erwin Schrodinger, this is him, he publishes this book titled What is Life? Now, Erwin Schrodinger primarily and principally was a guy involved in quantum mechanics. This is the same guy for whom Schrodinger's cat is named, for whom Schrodinger's equation in quantum mechanics is named. And he writes this book titled What is Life? And it's a series of um, of thoughts and questions he can, he's saying that you could ask about how to sort of think about uh, biology from the lens of a physicist. You know, how would a physicist and a mathematician think about solving biological problems? Can you explain away a lot of things that people have discovered about cells using ideas from physics? And so what he said is that, you know, you're analyzing whatever we have so far, all the biological information you have so far, using the ideas about atoms and molecules that people have just been discovering just 30 years earlier in the world of physics. And this is a really big early influence on structural and molecular biology. So you know, people who come later in the next two or three decades who are thinking about, you know, the structure of things like DNA, like Rosalind Franklin, the people who are thinking about structures of proteins like Linus Pauling, those people are sort of, they've credited Irvin Schrodinger's thoughts and what is life to say like, you know, this was the guy who put me on this track and started thinking about, you know, what is some physical origin for a lot of these things we're seeing. So it's an important thing to keep in mind our history. This is a guy who put forth some of the early ideas. There were others who came around the same time, but these were in 19, in the 1940s were some of the first inklings of, you know, maybe you can do this too. And so we can think about like how we kind of build a framework from first principles for analyzing biology. So if we think about like our models, our biophysical models, models of biological systems that are strongly rooted in, you know, the ideas of physics, there's about four big theories that I think go into this. Of course, there are many others, but there's four big ones. The first being thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of heat, energy, disorder, entropy, how energy is exchanged, also favorability of processes, binding, um, how favorably things happen, how reactions occur, how things need to be oriented with respect to each other, the behavior of large collections of molecules, all of these fit into the wide, re, uh, the wide regime of thermodynamics. And it's a very beautiful field. It's a very nice field with a lot of great ideas. And it's gonna be something I'm talking about for the, last, the rest of this talk. The next is fluid dynamics, not something um, that I'll be talking about today, but also very important. Fluid dynamics governs how fluids flow. So, for example, cells that are going through the blood, you need to have some ideas and equations from fluid dynamics to explain how that occurs. You need to be able to explain how molecules move within a cell within the cytoplasm. These are all fluid dynamics concepts. Next is kinetics. Kinetics is more of a concept from chemistry and physical chemistry, which tells us about how quickly processes occur. And this is an extremely important idea when you're talking about cellular reactions. For example, how quickly enzymatic reactions occur, how quickly metabolism occurs, how quickly a protein is being folded from one state to another state. These are important things that govern how well a cell can homeostate, how well a cell can live. And so that's why kinetics would be an important thing to consider. And the last is electrostatics. That is the laws of electricity and magnetism, sort of. Um, so electrostatics, principally, we're going to be dealing with electric forces. So things like where positive ions, negative ions have to attract and repel each other in a particular way, and how those can really, really govern uh, macromolecular structure, which is, again, a very important uh, phenomenon for uh, for biology in general. So we're going to be focusing principally on the first and last of these I've highlighted here, thermodynamics and electrostatics. And I'll just talk a little bit about these two fields and what consequences they have for um, our understanding of, 
of contemporary biology. So this slide is just going to be a lot of words. Um, you don't have to read everything here. What I'm going to basically say here is that thermodynamics is what set the stage for a lot of modern biology, for a lot of modern biochemistry, for a lot of modern biophysics. If you talk to any person involved in molecular biology, they're going to tell you how important thermodynamics is. Laws of thermodynamics govern everything. You can't beat them. They tell you how every process occurs, whether it's biological or not. And so one of the key goals that a biophysicist might undertake is to say, you know, if you have a biological problem, say, you know, how a protein folds or how a cell grows or how a molecule moves from one end of a cell to another end of a cell, <clears throat> how can we build a model that really well explains that that's heavily rooted in the ideas of energy, of entropy, of free energy, these sorts of ideas from thermodynamics. And um, an interesting development that occurred, you know, just uh, maybe 50, 60 years prior to Erwin Schrodinger's writings in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, is the development of this theory known as statistical mechanics, which is kind of the OG sort of thermodynamics out there. Um, statistical mechanics was a framework used um, very early on to describe um, the behavior of large collections of molecules. So, you know, it's great when you're a physicist that you get to think about, you know, the behavior of one or two atoms. You know, all physicists like to think about is like, what does one atom look like? It's a great question. But biological systems rely on moles and moles and moles of molecules. And each mole is like 10 to the 24th atoms. And so really now you're trying to think about how can I understand the behavior of not one, but say 10 to the 24th atoms, 10 to the 26th atoms. And that's a lot of atoms to think about. And so instead of thinking about the behavior of each one of those, um, physicist said, maybe you can just think about the statistical properties of them as a whole collection of things. And this was a really great development because it allowed you to think about collections and of large bulk properties and, you know, how big things behave. And this is a big stepping stone towards maybe trying to understand how cells, which are just massive collections of atoms and molecules, could behave. Um, the other thing that we that I said I would mention um, is just about electrostatics and molecular interactions. So every interaction, whether you've been told this or not, is somehow electrostatic in nature. As you were probably told in introductory biology class, the most common electrostatic interaction is your ionic bond between positively charged and negatively charged ions. You might see this in the tertiary structure of a protein. Um, so when you have positively and negatively charged amino acids in a protein that are near to each other, they can attract. If you have two positively charged amino acids, they can repel each other. And these cause certain conformational changes within a protein. And so these are very important. But uh, it's also important to think about the fact that a lot of other intermolecular interactions are also electrostatic in nature. For example, the hydrogen bond. And so uh, I'll see if I can draw here because I think it's useful to draw. So pen right here. A hydrogen bond is a bond between, say, the hydrogen attached to one electronegative atom, somehow linked to another electronegative atom somewhere else. So these are two water molecules. A hydrogen bond looks something like this. And this people don't really consider to be an electrostatic interaction. However, it really is because it works by having a pot a partial positive charge, a partial positive charge on the hydrogen get attracted to a partial negative charge on an oxygen atom. And these partial charges are charges nonetheless. So this is a sort of electric force between a positive and a negative interact, a positive and negative charged um, sort of piece of a molecule. And even things like London dispersion forces or van der Waals forces are just, you know, small local disturbances of a big electron cloud that create microscopic electric forces between two molecules. And so even those, any, any interaction, interaction you can think of really is just uh, very strongly connected to, uh, to electrostatics. And so, you know, if you think about like atoms are surrounded by electrons, electronic dis uh, distributions create fields, all of these interactions are gonna have some sort of electrostatic component. And so now we're going to think about just this is a sort of potential energy function. Um, potential energy functions are really useful for thinking about intermolecular interactions. You've probably seen um, something that looks like this. Basically, a potential energy function tells you the potential energy of a system um, 
with response to some variable. And in this case, the variable is like the distance between two atoms, for example, in an intermolecular interaction, you can see that there is a certain distance at which this potential energy is minimized. And that corresponds to, you know, the most stable distance between two things. It corresponds to a stable interaction. And so uh, the key point here to think about is again, that, you know, these intermolecular interactions um, have a potential energy associated with them. They have a particular distance associated with them. And again, all of them rely on the ideas of electrostatics. And we'll come back to these ideas in a later part of the talk. So I'm now gonna conclude this first part of the talk by saying that, you know, based on all the ideas that we've come through so far, in terms of thermodynamics and electrostatics, also fluid mechanics, kinetics, and other things, um, it's important to build models. So you have a system, you have a problem, you can say, okay, this is all the basic principles from physics and chemistry that I know. How do I apply them to explain this problem away? And after you construct such a model, you say, what experiment can I do to see is this model correct? Can I do something to test this part of the model? And so you can say, you know, suppose I'm studying photosynthesis, you can say, can I build a model to explain how the energy is transferred from one photosystem to the next? Um, if you're studying T cell activation, which is something that I research, you can think about, um, is there a way in which you can analyze uh, the rates at which a T cell is activated in response to binding to a reticular antigen or something like that? Um, if you're studying axon conduction along nerve signals, uh, uh, axonal conduction of nervous signals, so like the electrical impulse going down an axon, you can think about, can I build, say, an electrical circuit model that explains how, uh, how this current is propagated? Can I explain also like, uh, saltatory conduction across myelin sheaths and between the nodes of RANVA. Um, can you explain all of these phenomena using basic ideas from physics? And so I have a graphic here, which says that, you know, you start from physical principles and you construct a new model. And you do, you do some experiments, you test the new model and you get some observations. And maybe your observations say, yes, this model is great. Or maybe they say, no, this model isn't great, and here's the problem. This part of it isn't able to explain the data that you're getting. So then you inform, and you refine, and you re-update, and you make a new model, and you just repeat the cycle over and over again until you publish a paper and someone else says, hey, this is good. And this is how you know science kind of progresses. So that concludes the first part of this. Um, I seem to have lost my cursor, so I'm going to see if I can... Uh, escape and try and get my cursor back. But while we're doing that, uh, if anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to ask. Give me one second uh, while I while I escape and reshare. Uh, are there any questions, Krish? Uh, there are no questions. Uh, there is a question. How long does mm -hmm. the process take to publish research on updating models from Sanjay? Uh, it could take a very long time, honestly. Uh, this process requires a lot of experimentation. Um, it could be really quick. It could be really slow. It really depends on you know the current model that you're working on, the types of experiments you're doing, how quickly these experiments progress. Uh, it, it, it all depends on the system that you're working on and, you know, how much experiments you how many experiments you can do how close you are to publishing the results so it all really depends it could take you know anywhere from a few months to anywhere to like several years some people have worked on things for several decades and finally publish you know some groundbreaking results good good question there's another question from lelouch where exactly do we build models where do we, okay, so I guess um, when I say build a model, I'm not talking about an actual thing you can hold. I'm talking about, say, uh, a set of ideas, a sort of framework. So you can just get a whiteboard and you can say, here are the facts. You know, I know these are the equations that I have to work with and this is what I'm seeing. So for example, let me give you the idea of like a neuron propagating uh, some electrical signal. So I can draw here, I guess. So if you have, say, a neuron, here's a neuron and it has a long axon. And here's the next neuron over here and there's a little synapse right here. And what happens when a neuron fires is there's some action potential here which sends an electrical signal all the way down in the form of some sort of current. And you can think about like, well, is there some way I can model this as a circuit 
just propagating some current along a wire? Can I model this as just a basic circuit with some resistors here and there, with some capacitors here and there, with just basic circuit elements? Can I just design some sort of imaginary fictitious model that can explain a lot of this behavior? Maybe not everything, but a lot of it. And that's the sort of model that I'm thinking about. I'm not talking about like you actually go out and you go and build a circuit and you say, this is what a neuron looks like. I'm saying, you know, you get your piece of paper and you say, this is what a neuron should look like. Here's what I'm gonna draw as a little circuit analog that looks like that. Those are the sort of models that we're thinking about. Just what can you come up with in your own head that sort of fits the bill, that looks like what you're trying to see? Great question again. Another question from Sanjay. What are resources mm -hmm. that can be used to learn more about the models and the mathematical aspects behind recreating models? So if you're talking about like learning about models that are already out there, you know, one thing you could do if it's available to you is to go out and take a, a class in either mathematical biology or physical biology or computational biology, you know, taking those classes will really expose you to a lot of these models. Um, if you're not able to do that, the best thing I could suggest is uh, some textbooks uh, have descriptions of these things. Uh, reading research papers is always a great way to understand new models. And, you know, if you're really not able to get that far, you know, you can always wait a little while. You'll go to college, you'll be able to get exposure to some of these classes, and you can see what some of these models look like. I, I guess that's sort of what you were asking. Maybe I kind of went off in a different tangent. I'm not really sure if that's what you were asking about. That seems to be it. Okay, sounds good. All great questions. So we can keep going. So the first thing here that I wanted to talk about, or I should go back to the title slide, is about machines and models. And I've kind of given it away in the next slide by saying that proteins are molecular machines. So proteins, as you probably know, are an essential biological macromolecule. And they govern a lot of physiological and biological processes. And you know, all the intermolecular and intramolecular motions that are out there can do molecular work, which is why we call them machines. So for example, if a certain protein changes the interactions that it makes, it can move, it can do certain things which can allow it to do work. And uh, what governs these interactions in motion are again, these two ideas, thermodynamics and electrostatics. So I'm sure you've all heard enough about ATP synthase to be bored by it. I still think it's a fascinating molecule. And so I have this little video that I'm gonna play. Um, first, let me mute it. Can you split off to release the energy within? I don't wanna listen to it. I'm just gonna come to about one minute here and play. You can watch ATP synthase is a little rotating protein that's stuck in the member, inner membrane of a mitochondrion. And, you know, in the presence of protons, the ATP synthase protein just sort of starts rotating and it starts producing ATP. And this entire rotating, uh, the rotatory motion is, you know, entirely, you know, autonomous. It's built into the structure of this protein. The way it folded, the interactions that it makes allow it to perform this rotatory motion and produce ATP from it. This is not a sentient process. Our, cell, our bodies are not saying to the ATP pro synthase protein, hey, you need to spin. This is not a conscious thought. These proteins are able to do this entirely autonomously just based on um, the environment that they're in. And you know, now this is too much detail for us, but I just wanted to show you guys that like these, these machines that are out there are really, really great. They're able to do some fascinating things. And it's, it's really a wonder that all of this is really just based in uh, thermodynamics and electrostatics, these basic ideas from elementary physics tell us a lot about how these things move, how they work, how the machines do what they do. No, I don't want the video to keep playing. So um, one of the first things that we wanna talk about is protein folding. So as you may know, um, for a protein to do what it does, it must be folded into its appropriate three-dimensional structure. So you may remember from the previous slide that the ATP synthase protein has all of these different pieces to it. There's little drum at the bottom, then there's the shaft, and there's this rotating head thing that's all strung together. It all has to be shaped the correct way in order for it to do the motion as it does. And that folding process is entirely, or almost entirely based in thermodynamics. That is, how do we balance the ideas of energy and entropy? And in thermodynamics, there's this fundamental concept known as the Gibbs free energy. 
This is this uh, this number delta G. And this Gibbs free energy number tells us about how favorable a certain process is. In particular, when you calculate this number for a system, for a process, um, if you find that it's negative, you find that this process occurs spontaneously. It's a favorable process. It works. It's great. If you find that when you calculate this number and it's positive, um, then it's actually an unfavorable process. And so the Gibbs free energy change is composed of two different quantities. It's composed of this delta H term, which is a energy component to it. And it's composed of a delta S term, which is an entropy or disorder component. That is, you know, if a system is reordering itself, how does that affect how favorable process is? In particular, if you're losing energy, this is very favorable. Things like to lose energy and settle down in a very low energy state. So if you have an energy loss that contributes to a very favorable process. Um, things also like to be messy. Things love to be disordered. So if you have an entropy gain, so if this delta S value is positive, if this number is positive and it's like, you know, the system is becoming more disordered, more messy, more random, then the process occurs very favorably. And you have to balance these two in terms and when you're trying to understand um, how a protein folds. So the energetics component of this is you're having an energetic cost. Every time you form an interaction, you gain you lose a little bit a little bit of energy. So every time you form a hydrogen bond, you lose a little bit of energy because that stabilizes your system. Every time you break an interaction, you need to add energy to break that bond open. So every time you're breaking interactions between say water molecules, if you're trying to fold up the protein and you reduce the number of interactions between water molecules, um, around it, then you're actually losing energy. But then you can regain a lot of the energy by folding up the protein itself when you make hydrogen bonds between different amino acids to make alpha helices or beta sheets. When you make all of these different intermolecular interactions in a protein, you can actually gain back all the energy that you um, sort of, or you can lose back all the energy you gained and you can come down to a net energetically favorable process. Um, interestingly, when you think about the disorder of a system, when you fold it up, when you fold up this long chain of amino acids that is a protein, when you fold it up, you're actually sort of reordering and you're increasing the amount of order in the system. And so you might think, well, here, the protein is actually becoming more ordered, and this is an entropic cost. And this is a problem that plagued scientists for a while. Scientists were trying to figure out, you know, like, if you think about it, this is entropically very unfavorable because proteins want to be disordered. Everything wants to be disordered. But when you fold it up, it actually makes it more ordered. And it turns out that what happens is that when you fold up a protein, you're actually decreasing the ordering of water around the protein. So all of the water molecules that are flowing around, around the protein are actually becoming less ordered than they would have been in the unfolded state. And this entropic gain, how much disorder you're gaining from the surroundings, is actually what drives folding. So the reason that proteins fold in the first place is because of the reordering of water molecules around the protein itself. This is the biggest contributor. You may have heard another word for this. This is, in a sense, the hydrophobic effect, um, the idea that you're pushing water molecules away from this hydrophobic core to the outside. It contributes to a net disordering and a net destabilizing of water molecules around the protein, which is the biggest contributor and biggest driving force for protein folding itself. So here you can just see a basic application of just simple ideas from the field of thermodynamics to where it's explaining away why proteins fold in the first place. Um, now, how they fold, the rules behind their folding is another problem entirely, and it's one that I'll touch on in the third part of this talk. Um, but why they fold is actually a pretty well understood um, question now, and it's been explained away by this model from thermodynamics with the hydrophobic effect included. Um, the folding process also has to account for electrostatics. So all we know so far, if we're talking about, you know, the thermodynamical favorability of a folding process, we know that it's very favorable for protein to fold. It's great. But we don't know how certain features arise. For example, why do alpha helices fold in the first place? Why do beta sheets fold? Why do we have loops and hairpins and Greek keys and all these other secondary structural elements, which you've probably heard of? Um, and the idea, the, the answer to that is sort of electrostatics. So there's a lot of electrostatic stability because of all the interactions you can make. So all of these interactions are in some way, shape or form electrostatic. Van der Waals forces, 
dipole dipole forces, hydrogen bonds, coulombic forces. These are, you know, these ionic pairs that you see between positive and negative charge amino acids and salt bridges. All of these things contribute to secondary and tertiary structure and actually give rise to the actual folded state. So not only do we need to think about why a protein folds, we need to think about why a protein folds in the way that it does, you know, with all these secondary and tertiary structural elements. And what, you know, fills in the gaps for us is the idea that, you know, all these electrical forces are what give rise to a lot of these secondary and tertiary structural elements. Although there is thermodynamics in play for these things as well. And so again, you know, thermodynamics helps us to account for a hydrophobic core in a protein and it, the requirement of some degree of structural organization. So the idea that you do need to have some sort of secondary structure. But what that looks like, what those secondary structural elements look like, is heavily governed by, you know, electrostatics. So what these helices and sheets look like, what ion pairs look like is governed by, um, you know, the electrostatic stability that each of these confers. Why do we have right-handed helices, but not so many left-handed helices also comes a little bit from the interaction between uh, electrons and protons and things like that. There is um, a basis for all of these structural characteristics and details in electrostatic forces. And so this is just an idea to give you give you guys that like, you know, these basic principles, which are entirely non-biological in nature, can be very well applied to a biological problem like this and to sort of answer away some pressing questions. So now I want to talk about um, protein structure prediction and sort of the how proteins fold the rules behind it. In general, you have proteins which are long chains of amino acids and you have to crumple them up and fold them and bend them and wind them and twist them into some 3D structure. And all of it could be, could be entirely determined by just applying the laws of physics to every single atom in the protein. This is computationally next to impossible. You could do what I said earlier and talk about the statistical mechanics and the statistical properties of this and try and reduce your system. But it turns out that that is a little bit too much of an oversimplification. And that actually just gives you the idea that they fold in the first place, but it doesn't tell you anything about their actual structures. And there's too much data to account for in general computationally. So how do you reliably go from sequence to structure without exclusively relying on the laws of physics, but also without neglecting them? You have to have some reliance. You can't just neglect them, but you can't only rely on them because it's just too hard of a problem to solve by just relying on them. So here, a graphic again to tell you how this works. In nature, nature always takes these strings of, of amino acids and it's able to fold them very easily. However, algorithmically, we don't really know how to do this because we don't have good folding rules. We don't have an algorithm that says, okay, you have this sequence folded up like this. It's very hard to do this. It's been a problem for decades. Um, for those of you who are in the CS field, I believe this problem is NP hard. So computationally, it's very, very difficult to solve. Um, but recently there have been some advances, which is the sort of topic of the next portion of this talk. But I think we've reached a sort of midway point here. So. We can stop and take any questions now. I'll check how we're doing on time. I'm just around halfway. So if we have any questions, we can get to those now. Okay, um, I guess that's no questions. Great, so we can move on to this third part, um, which I titled David Baker, Google in the Future. So. I guess probably within the last two decades, I don't want to say it's that old, um, probably within just the last decade, um, a, a guy who works in, uh, and a guy, a scientist who works in uh, the University of Washington in Seattle by the name of David Baker, he and his lab sort of constructed this crowd computing, distributed computing project known as Rosetta, which became a tool for analyzing and predicting protein structures. So his main goal was to say, you know, I want to solve this problem where if you give me the amino acid sequence for a protein, I can tell you what its folded structure looks like. Why is this useful? Um, in general, we want to know what the structure of a protein is because that gives us key clues about you know what a protein does. If it has certain folded motifs, you can say maybe this is an enzyme that cuts up DNA, or maybe this is an enzyme that breaks down lipids, or maybe this is an enzyme that makes other proteins. Um, 
so these are you know important details that you can gain from structural characteristics but solving the structure of every single protein you see is hard it takes a lot of effort to go out do experiments do a diffraction study and get the structure of a protein and there's a lot of people who do this but you know it would be a lot easier if you could just say here's the sequence which is easy to find what does the structure look like i don't have to do any experiments i just want the computer to tell me the problem is it's not easy to do that but uh Rosetta became a tool where it was pretty good at doing this. And so it was basically, a, a lot of it is volunteer crowd computing efforts where you can sort of play folding games on your own at home. And the major Rosetta hub sort of integrates all of these solutions users have given to create some sort of uh, new rules and new algorithms to do better prediction. Um, and it's basically become a sequence to structure pipeline that's reasonably accurate. And it was again, um, sort of designed by this guy, David Baker in his lab um, I had the pleasure to meet him at a seminar uh, probably early 2020 before COVID started, just before COVID started. And he's a really nice guy. Um, he is really invested in this field of protein biophysics, protein structural biology. Um, if you ever have a chance to check him out, it's uh, always a great way to learn a lot about this field. Um, and I think he's really doing some big things. Um, another thing that his lab is involved in with using Rosetta and other protein structure prediction algorithms is de novo design, which is the idea that, well, not only can we feed in a protein sequence, which directly comes from DNA. So you could take, you know, the DNA from some gene and you can say, this is what the, this gene codes for this protein. Here's the sequence, feed it into the program and see what the structure is. Now we can analyze it. That's a great pipeline. Now you can also say, well, maybe I want to design a protein that looks like this and does X, Y, Z things. Maybe I wanna design some enzyme based on all of these other structures of enzymes that I already know are out there that looks like this. How would I do that? And it also, and it turns out that Rosetta can be a great tool for going the other way, structure to sequence given certain structural characteristics. So if I want it to bind to ATP or I might, maybe I want it to bind to GTP or some cancer drug, how do I design a protein structure to do that. And once you have that structure, Rosetta can back calculate a sequence for you and give that back to you. And this is the idea of de novo design. Um, and this Rosetta program has made some pretty big advances in you know, vaccines, antivirals, biomolecular therapeutics. Um, recently, they were heavily involved in COVID-19. They developed um, the structures. So they used de novo design to develop the structures for like, I think, 15 to 20 different antiviral uh, molecule candidates. And so they're heavily involved in, you know, doing uh, structural biology in a way to, you know, target these illnesses and far more. You can read all about the things that they're working on on their website. There's a lot of different labs out there. They're using Rosetta to think about structural prediction and structural biology in general. So it's a great way to a, become involved in citizen science. They have, you know, home programs that you can run on your own computer because it's a distributed computing project. Um, but you can also just learn about the science that they're doing. It's a great way to get involved in this field. Um, but now I want to turn my attention to AlphaFold, which um, I'm sure you guys maybe have even heard about recently, it has been making a lot of news. Um, AlphaFold is a deep learning based algorithm um, designed by DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google. And recently they developed their own protein structure prediction algorithm. Um, so there's, there's this competition, I guess, every year called the critical assessment of structure prediction or something like that, where every year or every two years, everybody comes in with their programs and they test their programs against, you know, against existing data to see, you know, is their program great predicting structure? And what they do there is they basically say, here's a sequence of a protein whose structure hasn't been published yet. We know what it is, but you guys never saw it. Your, your program, we want you to see how accurate you can be. And they test it over many, many, many different proteins and they give you a score. In the end, they say like, your model is this percent accurate. And previously, David Baker was like the routine winner for this competition. In 2018, Google comes around, designs their deep learning, machine learning, you know, massive computing project. And they blew everybody out of the water in 2018 with AlphaFold. Um, in 2020 or 2021, either one of those, I'm not really sure when they published it, um, they published AlphaFold 2. And AlphaFold 2 is kind of the, the godson, the, the, the 
basically the epitome of all computational biology, I guess, um, because they have managed a feat that almost nobody else has, which is almost complete accuracy of protein structure prediction for a very, very large number of proteins. I mean, they have blown everybody out of the water. Um, here's the abstract for a paper that they recently released. I think they released this paper just around two weeks ago, to the 15th of July, um, where they released this paper that sort of detailed um, how their program works and how they presented remarkably accurate predictions at the recent CASP 14 um, conference. So this is that program that I, uh, this competition that I was talking about, they recently competed and had very, very, very accurate predictions at this competition. So they're doing really well for themselves and they're really doing well for the structural biology community um, as a whole. Um, structural biologists often like to joke that now Google has taken all of their jobs because these guys are the future. So they're using deep learning to reliably predict structure. It's very great results. It's a really great way to say, you know, now we have this algorithm, can I just feed in information directly from the genome, which we already have all of that information. The Human Genome Project has done all of this great work. We know what all of these genes are. We know what all of these proteins are. We know the sequences of everything. Can we feed that into this program and look at what the structures of these proteins are and kind of gauge and understand what the biological implications are of each of these different genes and proteins. Um, but what continues to elude us is the rules of folding. So now we have some black box. It's a neural network. It's a black box. We don't really know what's going on inside this program. We just know that it's learned how to fold better than we know how to fold. We don't know how to fold, but somehow this algorithm has learned how to fold quite well. And we still don't know what the real rules are. If you have an arginine next to a lysine, next to a histidine, next to a methionine, next to an arginine, next to a proline, next to a glycine, next to a hundred different other amino acids. How do you reliably predict and what rules should this folding process follow? And this is again, a theoretical model of folding that you need to build from just biophysical first principles, but it's a really hard problem that we still haven't solved. And you know, maybe soon or maybe not so soon, somebody will solve it, but we are well away from doing it already. Um, some new directions that we can go now that we have this great stuff is to understand folding rules. Um, by probing how this deep learning algorithm works. So maybe this algorithm can teach us something now that it's learned how to fold pretty well. Maybe it can teach us how to fold too. That's something that we could think about doing. The other thing is we can understand how things misfold. So now that it's done folding so well, maybe we can think about how do things misfold. You may have heard of these uh, misfolded proteins known as prions, which are protein infectious particles. Um, protein infectious particles are uh, are misfolded variants of proteins, which are very prone to aggregation. Um, and they destabilize a lot of the structural elements inside cells, and they can easily and rapidly cause cell death when they accumulate in a cell. And so we can really think about how we study misfolded proteins in the sense that, you know, when we study a misfolded protein, we can think about A, how to refold it into its correct nature, and B, you know, just understanding the process of misfolding so we can better understand prion-based diseases because there's a lot of them. Um, you may know that a lot of neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, dementia, Huntington's, um, crispr jakob encephalopathy, these things are all very closely tied to prion-based protein misfolded diseases. Um, and so if we understand the process of misfolding a little bit better, we can understand how to treat and cure these illnesses a little bit better. So again, structural biology, even these COPSI guys that are like just doing deep learning all the time are really making big contributions um, to the field. So what's missing? Um, I've told you all this great information. We're kind of at the precipice of, you know, like we have all of these great programs, we have all this great information, and we have all of the tools, sort of. What's missing? Uh, the first thing that's missing is dynamical information. Um, structural biology is great. Uh, you can look at pr pictures of proteins all over the internet and we can see like, oh, this is what ATP synthase looks like. And this is what the tau protein looks like. And this is what the alpha synuclein protein looks like. And this is what, you know, the galactosidase enzyme looks like. These are what these proteins look like. But what do, what conformational fluctuations and changes occur during their function? In essence, what is their spatiotemporality sort of? 
in terms of space and time, how do they behave? Do they open up and close? Do they bind something and sort of twitch a little bit when they're doing their function? What are the dynamical things that they're doing? And that's really the key to function. You wouldn't know what ATP synthase was doing to make ATP until you learned that it was rotating. And so methods to study these dynamical properties include FRET, um, single molecule FRET. There's this other thing called Lorette, or I think it's called Lorette. Um, and you can use these other, you know, biophysical techniques to study the dynamical properties of proteins. And if you can synthesize this information with the structural information you're getting from all these cool new structural biology advances, you're really making headways to solving a lot of great um, biological problems. The other thing which sort of ties into this is, you know, the, the programs don't tell us a lot about the conformational landscape a protein can, can sample. So a conformational landscape is essentially a large large, large uh, sort of sample space of protein structures that a protein could fold into, which is sort of diagrammed here. You can see that at low energy states, we like to fold. At high energy states, we like to remain unfolded. And so we want to fold into a very low energy state. And you can sample all of these different little conformations. A protein can fall into here and be in some partially folded state, or it can fall into here in some partially folded state, or it can fall into here and be in some partially folded state. And proteins would like to be in their native conformation. However, you can see that they can also unfold and refold in a in, a, in an incorrect conformation and become what's known as an amyloid fibril. This is a misfolded aggregate. They can become an amorphous aggregate, which is not good for a cell. They can become an oligomer, not really good unless it's structurally relevant. So again, a protein could fold into all of these different conformations despite only having one correctly folded conformation. And we can't really gain information about what it samples and when it samples them using these uh, algorithms that I've described so far. And we can also not gain information about whether these samplings are transients, whether it's just flip-flopping right between these, like just flip-flopping right here, which would be a dynamical thing, versus when it gets stuck right here. When you get stuck here, it's really hard to come out of a very deep well like this, and you get stuck in these fibril structures. And these amyloid fibrils, for instance, are a big proponent of what um, what causes and what triggers Alzheimer's disease and um, other amyloid fibrils can be involved in Huntington's disease. And so you would like proteins to avoid getting stuck into wells like this unless it's their native state. So again, you can't gain information about this conformational landscape from just thinking about uh, the algorithms that we have so far, but it's a pretty big headway because they could help us understand these things eventually. So now we've reached part four, which is very, very short. Um, so I can again take questions now. Uh, this is our last sort of section before we finish up. There are a couple of questions. So first one from Vikash. What do you think about the role of quantum computing and structure prediction? Great. Uh, I don't know enough about quantum computing to say one way or another, other than the fact that it is massively advantageous to do, you know, to doing uh, large numbers of hard calculations. I suspect that in the next several years, there will be people who are trying to do quantum computing with structure prediction. I don't know if anyone's doing this right now, but again, it's such a large amount of data that I couldn't help but think that someone's out there that's going to do it and it will probably revolutionize the field. How, I'm not too sure. Great question. Second question from Rouge. As we see AlphaFold completely dominating over its competition, without being given any human understanding into how folding works, is the future now going to be just coding exact physical processes like molecular, molecular level energy transfer, et cetera, and just let supercomputers do all the work for us? Um, so I think no, and I'll get into that in this last section is all I can say. Um, but I think the answer to that is gonna be no. Uh, you do need humans because, uh, we haven't reached a point at which deep learning algorithms can tell us everything. Uh, deep learning algorithms and machine learning algorithms sometimes don't even know how they, they work on their own. As you may know, we kind of understand how neural networks work, but there's still a lot of work we need to do to understand how neural networks work in the first place to begin with. And so if a program is just able to do things, but it doesn't know how it's doing them, and we don't know how it's doing them, that's not a particularly rewarding way of doing science in the first place. And it's not really elucidating anything new. We're just kind of doing computation. We're not learning anything new. <clears throat> so I think there will always be uh, a human hand to play 
in these sorts of discussions. Um, there will be an increased reliance on computer programs. I've had this discussion with other people, PhD students, postdocs and things about whether, you know, eventually we're going to see just Nobel Prizes handed out to the computer themselves because the computer is doing all the work. And I don't think that will happen. Um, I think that computers and computing will play a larger and larger role in this space. But fundamentally, you know, we need humans to think about these problems and to build these models and computers can do what computers do, compute. There is a follow-up question. Does this yes. mean studying biology itself not going to be that relevant in the future as compared to studying physics, maths, or and or computer sciences? and stimulating biological processes directly? So this is also a question I will get into, um, and I guess I'll answer right now, so I'll hold off on that, um, but also another great question. I'm about to get to it though. That is the question for now. Okay, so the question that was just asked is sort of what's on the screen right now. Is biology done? Are we done studying biology? Have we learned everything that's useful? Is it great to just, you know, go back to our basics and study physics like Newton did? And the answer is no. This is kind of a interesting take on it because all I've talked about today is how you can build um, an approach to studying biological problems entirely from first principles. You can do all this stuff with just math. Um, you can do all this stuff with just physics, but I think there's something that you really need to get out of biology and that's the fact that just because a physicist says something doesn't mean you should believe them because a physicist works with atoms and they work with little electrodes in their little lab or they work with a pencil and a paper or they work with chalk and a whiteboard. And this is all good. This is a very good way of solving problems, but it doesn't get out in the real world in terms of here's something that I saw in my microscope. Here's some new cellular process that I saw that I cannot explain. You still need to go out and do those experiments and figure those things out and do these experiments to test your physical models and find out all this new cool information from the biological world before you just go and sit down with your piece of paper and your pencil and you study your problem. The hard part is ahead. So specifically in regards to protein structure prediction, Prediction is kind of solved. I wouldn't say it's entirely solved because we don't know how, you know, deep, deep mind, uh, how alpha fold works. Um, and alpha fold isn't at 100% yet. It's close, but it's not. Eventually it's going to get there. I'm sure it will. But the actual problem of folding is very unsolved. And it's going to take more than a mathematician and a physicist to solve it. It's going to take someone who has the biological expertise, the biological experience, who's done the experiments in the lab, who's worked with the biology of these systems to know how things are work. There's an increased reliance and there's an increased shift in the field towards studying things from a molecular perspective, from a very basic perspective. There are more physicists and mathematicians who are going into the field of theoretical biology and they're doing great work. But I think fundamentally you do still need people who are studying the biological problems on their own. Um, another thing that I did mention earlier in terms of this whole structural world is that you still need to go out there and study the dynamical features of things. There's no computer program as of yet that will be able to reliable, re reliably predict the dynamical information that you can get out of doing an experiment on the dynamics of proteins. You can do simulations and those are great, but they're not perfect. The perfect way to do it is to go out and do your experiments and really study these biological problems in the world, in their setting, in a cell. Physicists do not know how to do work inside of a cell. They can only best do their models. And so we can, again, return to, you know, the first quote that I've listed on my first slide. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and the idea that we could just do things with just physics and math and build all these models and call it a day is, it's nice, but it's wishful thinking because the models that you get, that you get will be wrong. They'll only be useful in the sense that they can sort of explain to a good degree of approximation what's occurring. And the real way to do science is again, go back to your lab, go look at your cells in the microscope, go look at your, you know, your mice or your rats or your humans or whatever you're studying, go out and do those experiments on your own and build your models that way. Uh, you need to have some sort of real biological experimentation. You really need to go and work with these things to get a full picture. So again, it's nice, but doing doing it just in, in your little workspace with you know a piece of paper and a pencil doesn't give you the full picture and it really never will. 
I think that's all I have. So we're just about five minutes out. I can stay for about five, 10 minutes afterwards if there are more questions. But um, if not, uh, thank you guys all for coming and listening to me drone on about things. It was great talking to you guys. And I can take any questions. I do have a question. So yes, there are, like you said, there's like the actual getting in a wet lab or whatever, like actually doing yes. the actual bio. And then there's also the computational or phys yeah. physics. So let's, if a person would want to, how would a person approach doing one or the other? And how would they, like what, like basically field should they go into to do one or the other? Sure. Um, so I guess I should have been more careful with my words when I said that you shouldn't do one or the other. I think there are important uses for both is what I meant. I said you shouldn't, in response to the question that said, is it useful to continue studying biology at all? I guess I meant to say it is. <clears throat> um, not to say that there shouldn't be people who spend all their um, all their efforts trying to build physical models entirely and not work with the actual wet lab stuff and do computation. Of course, we need people doing both. Um, and so if you're interested in doing that, my advice would be to, to say like, you know, am I, am I interested in trying to learn about the physics behind these things? If so, take a couple of physics classes, which can give you that exposure. Um, if your interest is to learn about the computational aspect of things, take some comp sci classes, get involved in like machine learning communities and that sort of thing. Um, if you're interested in math, you know, try and get involved in like things like numerical analysis and partial differential equations and modeling patterns, stochastic processes, all of these ideas that are very closely and intimately tied to the biological world and get your background there. You should have a strong background in all of these things. Um, but fundamentally, you should not let your interests if you're interested in it, stray too far from the biological side of things. Because again, humans aren't robots. Biology isn't just robotic. It's not all machines. A lot of it is proteins and molecular machines, but it's not all machines. There is nuance to it. And so you should also keep in mind that cells are a little bit different from just the atoms and qubits and things that you work with on your computers. I don't know if that answered the question. I think I got a little bit lost there. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, another question from Roche. This might sound a little bit silly, but do we need to fully solve the folding problem? Like it's true for the sake of sciences, but say we build a very complex computer model for a protein and then experiment on it. So I, I'm not sure I understand the second part of that. So maybe you can try thinking about reformulating that um, as, as regards to the first one. Yes, you're right. Um, mostly it is for the scientist's benefit. Uh, understanding the solution to the folding problem would be great. Scientists would be really happy. Um, the layperson, I don't know how much they would stand to gain from it now. I think in the far future, maybe it might assist things like de novo design of drugs, de novo design of antivirals and things like that. Yes, we already have programs and machine learning algorithms that can do it, but we don't know how they work. If we could code in protein, uh, um, algorithms where we know exactly how they work, where they have all of the rules and they're doing it very algorithmically, you know, maybe that might be even better solution than just deep learning all of your problems away. So I think in the near future, probably if we solve the folding problem tomorrow, it would make a lot of headlines, but not a lot of people would be able to directly and tangibly use those results. But I think long term, it could do no harm. We could understand, you know, how things fold a little bit better. We could understand how to design potential therapies and cures and treatments better. And I think, you know, that's where the that's where the benefits lie. It's never in the short term, it's always in the long term here. I didn't really fully understand the second question in regards to building a big computer that's a protein. Uh, she followed up and said, like say we need to experiment how a protein responds to a certain chemical. Can we get the result mm -hmm. via directly making a computer stimula simulation? You can, um, but again, simulations only go so far. Uh, simulations cannot predict everything and you need to go out and do your experiments. You can do all the simulations in the world and find that, you know, 
sometimes the results are just not exactly what you saw. There's there's even a meme about that. It's like, you know, just like the simulations or whatever, but it's really not just like the simulations. Um, doing experiments in a cell, doing experiments at your bench is a lot different. Proteins responding to drugs inside a human body is a lot different than proteins responding to a drug in silico. Uh, doing everything with computers is uh, useful, but it will not give you the full picture. Um, Doing it is certainly extremely important. I see no reason not to. But again, it's not the final answer, and it should never be the end-all, be-all. A question from Sanjay. How would you recommend yeah. getting started in the field of simulations and assessing biological systems? Are there any recommended books or resources? Uh, so in terms of, so this is a question more geared towards a, a computational biologist, which I am definitely not. Um, I don't have too much experience in the world of simulations and things. So my advice would be to, if you're really interested, A would be to look up who the people that are doing this are, people in your area who might be able to help you get resources, um, send you books and things. There may be other like people at a university near you that might be able to assist you better if you're really interested in that. Um, if this is sort of like a part-time interest, you know, getting involved in some sort of like coding projects, learning about like simulation and molecular dynamics programs. I know there's a program called VMD, which is a molecular dynamics program. Um, I've tried to use it before, but it doesn't really work on my computer too well, but I know that it is sort of a molecular dynamics program. Um, I don't really know how to call it. Um, it's just like a program or an application, I guess. Uh, and maybe you can get started there, reading some of those documentations and just playing with it on your own a little bit. Um, the best way, again, to get involved in these things is to ask people who are in, involved directly in these things. So if you know someone who's doing a simulation-based project, talking to them, seeing how they got involved, and then just playing around with things on your own. But that's my advice. I'm sorry that I don't know enough about simulating things. I know people who do simulate stuff, but I personally have never done so and probably never will. A question from Archit. Once we get mm -hmm. to a point where almost 100% of external conditions can be replicated within computer simulations, could the case be made that computational studies would have more benefit per the time investment compared to wet lab studies? Sure, if you can simulate everything. And you know, I think that's well a ways away. Uh, but if you can simulate every single detail of everything, which means simulating the behaviors of every single atom and molecule which is a lot. I mean, the amount of data that's out there. I mean, think about it. So if you're thinking about a, a mole of water, which is about 18 grams of water, that contains about six times 10 to the 23rd water molecules. And each water molecule has three atoms. So that's 1.8 times 10 to the 24th atoms. If you have a computer which can simulate entirely the behavior of one mole of water with nothing in it, I mean, you deserve a lot of awards coming your way if you can predict the behavior of every single one of those things. Now add into that the complexity of all of the other things in a cytoplasm, salts, proteins, lipids, the cell membrane, all the organelles, all the random other junk that's floating around in our cytoplasm. It's a lot. Um, and I don't know how close or how far we are. We may be several decades, maybe even a century off from even having the computing power to do all of that. So I think, yeah, when you get to that point, yes. But at that point, a lot of things will be made obsolete. Your entire life would be entirely, you know, predictable. Everything would just be deterministic. You would say like every atom is going to move here in the next instant. And of course, there's quantum mechanical limits to that. You can't predict everything, but if you can predict to the level of quantum mechanical uncertainty, A, you've done something near impossible, but B, yes, you've made the case that maybe everything can be done in silico in computers. I think we're well away, uh, well away from that right now, but you make a point, yes. That does seem to be the last of the questions. Great. Um, you can exit this and stop sharing. Well, Samir, thank you for coming today. I think everyone enjoyed yeah, it. Was... Everyone learned a lot as well. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much for inviting me. And it was great 
hearing all of your questions and really nice meeting you guys. Um, I don't know if you guys, if you have my email or anything, you can feel free to share it with people. Actually, maybe so that my school email doesn't get spammed, I will share my personal in the chat here. And, you know, Chris, you can take it and you guys can just send questions by email to me if you think of anything. Um, again, I can try and send you resources towards computational biology things, but my main interests are not computational in nature. I'm more interested in experimental biophysics and a little bit more theoretical biophysics. So uh, I can try and see what I can do computational bio-wise, but probably not too much. Well, uh, yeah, I'll share your email with the others as well. But other than great. that, that should be it. So once again, thank you again. Yep, it was great meeting you guys.